we begin uh, looking at what I'm calling voices from the incarnation or voices surrounding uh, the incarnation, really. Uh, and so last week we looked at the shepherds. And if you're, if you're familiar with uh, biblical history, we talked about this on Sunday evenings when the, when the intertestamental period set in at the end of the time of the prophets, the end of the Old Testament, that there was 400 years uh, during which time there was not a word from God, not a prophet sent, not an angelic voice. And then as time approached for the coming of Messiah, born in Bethlehem, the angelic activity heightened considerably. We looked at that last week. By the way, when Jesus returns, one of the indications will be the heightening of angelic activity. It seems to be in God's plan that when his son is on the move, the angels become increasingly active. And so today we're going to take another look, another set of voices of the women who surrounded that time. One uh, is Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. One, of course, as you would expect, is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then another who's not as well known. Uh, in fact, you'll see when we get there that we don't even have a quote from her, but we have the essence of what she was saying is Anna, who was a prophetess who waited for the coming of Messiah, longed for that. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to Luke uh, chapter 1, verses 39 to 45. Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 45, and stand with me if you would. You follow along as I read uh, this wonderful section, beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. We're told in previous verses that the connection here, the familial connection is their cousins in some way. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May we be taught today by the faithfulness of these precious women who, who manifested a trust in God and marveled at the great works and tidings of God. Thank you. Please be seated. So when we think about the women, and we looked at a little bit of this last week as, as the angels were engaging different ones. When we think about the response of the women, the remarks of the women. Uh, you cannot help but be moved. We live in interesting times. People seem to go out of their way to suggest that if you are a Bible thumper, if you're someone who reads and believes the Bible, then, then you are somebody who is archaic. You're, in fact, you're probably, if you're a woman who reads the Bible, you're probably some, uh, some really put down, um, pr probably abused, uh, treated less than standard human being, living a miserable life. If you're a man who believes the Bible, then you're probably a, a, a misogynistic, uh, what, what do they call it, toxic male. Folks, that can only be said by people who are ignorant of the Bible. When you read the Bible, you've got to be struck with how, how the 
era surrounding not only the coming of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus, but the ministry of Jesus and following lifted women and gave women prominence that no culture before had. And even today, in certain religious settings, the, uh, the, the contemporary darling religion of the day, Islam, that Islam treats their dogs better than they treat women. Jesus Christ, his coming, his life, death, burial, and resurrection, his institution of, of evangelical Christianity transformed the role of women in the culture. And you see a little taste of this today, how prominent a role the women play. When you, when you go to the end of his life and read the, the time surrounding his death, burial, and resurrection again, women play a prominent role in that. So I want you to read this today as seeing women uplifted, greatly used by God because they're greatly blessed by God. When we look at, at our text here and ask ourselves, what did Elizabeth say? Well, verse 41 says, when she heard the greeting of Mary, so Mary has gone to visit. Remember, a little background, last week, the angel came to Mary and said, that which is conceived in you is, is of the Holy Ghost. Do not be afraid, Mary. Do not be afraid to take to yourself what God has given to you. You're carrying a child. Don't let that dismay you. Because the Holy Spirit has done this. And so, in fact, here's the proof of it. The angel was not obligated to give a proof. What a blessing. He said, your cousin Elizabeth, who's past childbearing, who's, who's already of an age that no woman could reasonably expect that she would bear a child, and she's barren, she's never born a child. She is even now in the sixth month of her pregnancy. So Mary took off to see this. Our text talks about this. And she greeted Elizabeth. And verse 41 says, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She is, she is now overcome by the Spirit of God who is going to teach her and inspire her to say some things. And I believe even use this encounter to to uh, assure her of what's going on. She was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women. This is, a, this is an older woman speaking to a teenage girl. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mary has not told her she is with child. Do you see what's happening here? The Holy Spirit is supernaturally orchestrating and, and maneuvering here to convince and encourage and strengthen everyone. If, if Mary needed confirmation, there it is. But there's going to be more. There's going to be more. Blessed are you among women. I told you last week that any self-respecting Jewish woman a maiden moving toward marriage, a woman who's married and had children, one of their great longing desires was to be the mother who would give birth to the Messiah. And here we see it. Elizabeth acknowledges, blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed is the child that you are presently carrying in your womb. And then why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, not my cousin, Mary, not my younger teenage cousin, the mother of my Lord should come to me. Do you see what the Holy Spirit is doing here? He is speaking word after word of encouragement and confirmation to Mary, who is in, uh, to say the least, a problem pregnancy, a young maiden who's betrothed to a man and they've never been together, the marriage has not been consummated, and here she finds herself with child. And then she says, For behold, 
when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, when I heard you calling out to me, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, are you here? The baby in my womb leaped for joy. Why? Well, John the Baptist is six months in gestation in the womb of Elizabeth. He is a human being. And as a human being, with the rational capacities, he's unborn to be sure, but he's a human being. And when, when the babe in the womb hears the voice of Mary, who is the mother of the coming Messiah, who herself is carrying the Messiah, the response is a leaping in the womb for joy. I told you last week that I was reading somewhere that, that the first human being to respond to the presence of Jesus was John the Baptist in utero. And then Elizabeth goes on. Not only am I blessed that the mother of my Lord would come to see me, not only am I blessed that the child I'm carrying has, has done a, a flip in the womb upon hearing the voice of Mary, but Mary, you're blessed. And blessed is she who believed this is the mark. Elizabeth believed. Joseph believed. Mary believed. She did not run to see Elizabeth out of wholesale doubt. The angel's the one that told her, go talk to Elizabeth. <laughs> you know the one who couldn't have children? Everybody felt sorry for? She's pregnant. So she goes and she sees this and she hears this. And Elizabeth says, Blessed is she, Mary, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, Elizabeth was not there. Nobody had come to tell her about the conversation. In fact, the first, first indication she would have had, the first opportunity to hear about it would have been from Mary herself. And, and Elizabeth says all of this before Mary can tell her anything. It's beautiful. It's precious. This, this response of Elizabeth, a woman full of faith. I love these things about Elizabeth. She trusted the Lord. She is happy for and not jealous of Mary. Blessed are you, among women. In other words, whatever blessings women have, you, Mary, are singularly blessed. By God's kindness and mercy, you have become the vessel of God to bring Messiah, the Lord, to us. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. But it doesn't end there. Before Mary and Elizabeth can have a conversation about the matter, before they can sit down and say, Elizabeth said, well, let me tell you what happened to me, what, what led to this time. And Mary said, well, let me tell you what happened to me. Before that can happen, Mary responds by praising God. Look at chapter 1 of Luke, verses 46 to 56. It's interesting. Mary didn't say, well, it's curious you should say that, Elizabeth, or thank you for saying that, or I feel better here. No, that's not the first thing that comes out of her mouth. You may know this passage, passage as the Magnificat. That's the first word in Latin, in the Latin Bible, uh, when you're reading this. It means I magnify. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. She's praising God. But she's praising God for the child she's carrying. And my spirit rejoices 
in God my Savior. You know, it's a popular song, been around for several years. Mary, did you know? There's a lot that Mary knew. She may not have been able to forecast all the things that would happen in Jesus' life, but she knew a lot. Listen to what she's te attesting to here. Magnifies the Lord, rejoices in God, my Savior. Take in what she has said here. She has fully embraced that the angel, when the angel said, that which is conceived is of the Holy Ghost. What Joseph had been told, that you shall, you shall call the name of this child that your betrothed is carrying Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, the Hebrew equivalent of Yahushua, Joshua, God my Savior. And this is what she refers to here. My spirit rejoices. When she says soul and spirit, she's, she's not uh, making a theological or ontological distinction. She's simply saying the innermost part of my being, my soul, my spirit, magnifies the Lord, rejoices in God my Savior. For, she's going to tell us why, he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. That's what she called herself when she said to the, to the angel, may it be done to your servant as you have said. He has looked, and the idea there is he has looked kindly, he has looked with mercy, he has looked with grace on the humble estate of his servant. And she understands well who is in her womb. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Parenthetically, she was not suggesting that all future generations would worship her and practice Mariolatry. That's not what's going on here. She had no intention that people would regard her as having celestial flesh and not being fully human. She had no intention of people setting up monuments and churches to her perpetual virginity. That was not what was going on here. She is saying generations going forward when they speak of Messiah and they speak of me, his mother, they will agree with Elizabeth what a blessing has come from God to let me be the vessel to bring the one who will save his people from their sins. All generations will call me blessed. Notice she did not say, will call me the blessed virgin. That was never in her mind. She was not. She would have other children uh, after, after Jesus was born. For he who is mighty, I want you to notice here how she, how she acknowledges what we would call the, the might of God and the mercy of God. He who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. He is, he is to be worshipped and adored, speaking of, of God the Father here. And his mercy, verse 50, is for those who fear him from generation to generation. She is Acknowledging here that she was raised in a setting where she was taught by her parents who were taught by their parents to have this holy reverence and awe of God. I'm going to tell you something. That is disappearing from the church today. It's disappearing. People figure that God's just thrilled with any attention that you pay him. God doesn't get giddy about that. He is holy. He's holy. And he said to us, be holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. And he not only expects, anticipates, I would suggest he demands his people worship and adore him and make that their priority. Everything else is a distant second. Why do you say that, Pastor? What do you think it's going to be like in heaven? Heaven is a place where angels continually cry out, Holy, holy, holy. I was witness to some Mormon missionaries years ago. 
and we can talk about eternity to come. And I began to describe heaven as it's spelled out in the scriptures. And one of these 18-year-old boys said to me, well, that sounds boring to me. And I said, well, I would suppose somebody who's been taught that you're going to be a god and populate your own planet would take that as being boring. But somebody who's been saved by the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, who anticipates being in his presence, completely delivered from sin in a glorified state, having the privilege to join the myriads of angels and the multitude, uh, the numberless multitude of those who've been saved throughout the ages, praising and adoring him, that fires me up. That's what she's saying here. She's acknowledging the might and the mercy of God. Verse 51, he has shown strength with his arm. This is one of the things that Isaiah the prophet prayed. Oh God, arise, bear the arm of your power and come down, that the people may rejoice in you. He has shown the strength of his arm. There's his might again. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. If you, you, you follow the narrative through in the Gospels, the religious leaders spent the entire time of Jesus' public ministry mad as hornets at him because he did not fit their narrative. The Roman generals, the Roman governors, the, the puppet, Jewish puppet kings, they all despised him. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. Verse 52, he's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. What she's saying here is all things being equal. If you had, if you had interviewed the Sanhedrin prior to this, if you interviewed the political, uh, politically powerful prior to this, they would have thought... I'm sure several, you would have had no problem finding Pharisees who believed uh, that perhaps their daughter would be the one from whom Messiah would come. You'd have found the same thing among, among Jewish royalty. Surely, if God were going to come to deliver his people, he would come from a royal palace. He would come from the religious elite. And surely he did not. He came to one of humble estate, and she says he exalts those of humble estate. The coming of Jesus turned that culture upside down. Upside down. Go on now. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Jesus would say later on in his ministry how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not because wealth is bad, but because in too many cases, not all cases, thank the Lord, too many cases, people who have wealth tend to worship that and not God. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. <coughs> and so she's, she is stating some, some powerfully profound truths here. <coughs> that would mark out the ministry of Jesus when he came to maturity. He has helped his servant Israel, verse 54, in remembrance of his mercy. You see this, uh, she's moving back and forth. His might, his mercy, his might, his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. So now she has appealed not primarily to the might of God, what he's doing, not even primarily to the mercy of God and what he's doing. Now she has appealed, appropriately so, to the faithfulness of God as the God who keeps his covenant. When she mentions uh, Abraham and his offspring forever, she is talking about God's covenant with Abraham, that he would bless Abraham's offspring and make them a blessing to the nations. So this, this, is a, this is a powerful, a very profound uh, 
praise that she breaks into here. And it needs to be considered for its value, and we need to recognize what a treasure Mary is to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to be worshipped, but to be uh, followed in her example of emphasizing God's might and his mercy and his covenant faithfulness. And then we're told that Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So, so she basically stayed with Elizabeth until the time for the birth of John the Baptist. And I'm sure in those three months, if someone had been taking down notes, we would be fascinated the conversations they had. There's two women sitting there, growing in their pregnancy. Elizabeth moving quickly to delivery. Mary in the, in the early, the first trimester, talking about God's goodness, the miraculous power of God. I'm sure those conversations were fascinating. So you have here Elizabeth's statements and Mary's statements, but I want to look at one, one more place. This is a little different. This is Anna in Luke 2, 36 to 38. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. So from the time they married, they were married seven years, and then he died, notice. And then as a widow, until she was 84, if she was typically of the age, if she was in mid-teens when she, when she married, early 20s when her husband died, for more than 60 years, she had lived as a widow. Well, what did she do? Well, we're told she devoted herself to temple service and the worship of God. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. So you get the picture here that pretty much any time you would stop by the temple, you would have bumped into Anna, a faithful godly woman. Now this is a time in the, in the narrative when they have brought Jesus eight days old to the temple uh, to dedicate him to go through the ritual circumcision as good Jews should and coming up at that very hour so she's there and they are there she began to give thanks to God now we don't have what she said verbatim but we have the essence of what she said and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. I want you to get a picture here. He's come with his parents into the temple. She's waited for this. She's fasted. She's prayed. Day in and day out. Week in and week out. Month in and month out. Year in and year out for more than six years decades and when Jesus is brought into her midst she begins to give thanks to God we can we can sense that her that the tone of her prayers has changed from from crying out to God oh God keep your promise with your people Oh, God, give us Messiah. Oh, God, send Messiah to your people. God, deliver your people. These are the kind of prayers that she would have, would have uttered. And when he is brought into her presence, the tone changes. She begins to give thanks to God. God has answered these prayers. She gives thanks to God. And not only does she give thanks to God, we're told that she speaks of Jesus to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. You may not capture the essence of this, but in, in, in these days, rolling out of the 400 years of silence, the people were aching, wondering, has God, has God abandoned us? Did, did we stray so far that God has felt justified in breaking his covenant promise with us? Has he gone on? Has he left us desolate? 
And so there's, there are people engaged in temple activity waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. What's the redemption of Jerusalem? It's the coming of Messiah. And so here's this woman who's prayed and cried out to God along with everybody else. And now she has shown that Messiah has been brought into her presence. And so her tone changes into giving thanks to God. And you, I get a picture of this woman going around to someone praying, interrupting. Are you, are you anticipating, looking for the redemption of Jerusalem? Oh, yes. Here he is. He's here. He's here. He has come. The Lord has sent him. Rejoice. What a, what a faithful example. I read these things. I admire these women. And I ask myself, do I have such faith? Elizabeth had faith in the early stages of this miraculous pregnancy. She couldn't, she couldn't touch, feel. She just had to take it by faith and act on it. Do I have such faith? Mary had to have faith that what was going to be increasingly manifesting itself in her condition was of God and not something that she should be ashamed of. Be willing to bear whatever reproach might come. I want to say, we didn't talk about this last week, but if you read on in the Gospels, one time when the religious leaders are, 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 are criticizing Jesus, they say, is this not Mary's son? You know what they were saying? In, in Jewish households in the first century, you did not call a man, a male child, as the son of his mother. He was passing on the lineage of his father. For them to call Jesus Mary's son was to be saying, we're not really sure who his daddy was. There's some kind of something suspicious, some kind of controversy. We've heard some really strange stories. About. They, were, they were laying an assault on the very character of Jesus and calling into question his mother when they would say, is not this Mary's son? What faith she had. And then Anna, do I persevere in prayer like that? Longing, aching, believing. Do I have the spiritual sensitivity of an Anna who after all those times of crying out to God recognized when God had answered? Do I have the evangelistic zeal of Anna? That when she recognized God had answered prayer, then she sets about helping others who've been crying out to God. Because he's here. He's here. You and I are going to encounter people in this season of the year who perhaps the rest of the year don't give one thought about a birth in Bethlehem. Who wonder about God. Are we going to be the ones who tell them he's here? He came. We're celebrating all of this because 2,000 years ago in an animal trough, in a stable, in a little town called Bethlehem, which, which meant house of bread, God sent his son, Jesus. And then finally... This was all happening in anticipation of the coming of Messiah. And I asked myself, am I living with such anticipation at the return of Messiah? No, we're not anticipating the incarnation. That's happened. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we, we beheld His glory, and His glory was as one uniquely begotten by the Father, full of grace and truth. That's happened. He lived, he died, he rose, he ascended, and he is returning. And I wonder sometimes, do I live as if I'm anticipating, highly anticipating, eagerly anticipating his return? Or do I live as if I would be just as content if it doesn't happen in my lifetime, or the lifetime of my children, or the lifetime of my grandchildren? In other words, do I live as if his return would be a great interrupter to my plans. 
We can learn so much from the women whose voices were mixed together in the incarnation of Jesus. And my prayer is that you and I will learn that. We will take action upon it. That we will be like faithful Elizabeth, faithful Mary, faithful Anna. But we're not finished. Next week, God willing, we're going to look at the men whose voices are also mixed at this marvelous time of the coming and birth of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.